Hello and welcome to the October meeting of the St. John Naturalist Club. I'm Julie Bauer, the program coordinator for the St. John Naturalist Club. And today we have guest speaker Shaylin Wallace, who will be presenting on amphibians of New Brunswick. Uh, before we begin Shaylin's presentation, I'd like to let you know about a few announcements and upcoming events that are being held by our club this month. I'm putting a link in the chat now. Um, next Saturday, so October 22nd, we're going to Deer Island for a guided birding tour led by Paul, Ma Paul Mans. Um, and two weeks from today, on October 29th, will be our 60th anniversary celebration. And it's going to be from 1 to 4 p.m. at Rivercross Church in St. John. There will be giveaways and food, and it'll be a great time. Um, also, between now and mid-November, we're looking for volunteers for our Point La Pro Bird Observatory Fall Migration Count. And so if you're interested in that, please contact us. Um, so we host webinars each month. Um, next month's webinar will be on the Fundy Biosphere. It'll be on November 19th at 10 a.m. So be sure to come back for that. Um, and also, if you're interested in becoming a member of the St. John Naturalist Club, or if you haven't renewed your membership yet, uh, the fees are now due um, and I'm putting a link to the membership page in the chat. And so that's all I have. I'm going to pass it over to Mary Salos, the chair of the program committee, who will introduce Shaylin. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thanks, Julie. Uh, our guest speaker today, as Julie mentioned, is Shaylin Wallace. Shaylin currently works as a species at risk biologist with the government of New Brunswick. She received her Master of Science in Environmental Management from the University of New Brunswick, where she focused on wood turtles in agricultural landscapes. Over the past five years, Shailen has uh, led a gray tree frog mark and recapture study with the Nature Trust of New Brunswick. And so today she's going to share some of her knowledge about the amphibians of New Brunswick. And I'll just ask you to put your questions in chat and then Shailen will uh, respond to those when she's finished her presentation. So right now I'm really pleased to welcome Shailen Wallace to the St. John Naturalist Club. And so now the camera and the mic are yours, Shailen. Awesome, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Okay, I'm just going to share my screen. Okay, so today I'm going to be talking to you guys about, yeah, amphibians in New Brunswick um, and, and going through that identification. Um, there are still frogs outside. It, it's starting to be wintertime and I'm sure some of them are going into hibernation, but you definitely can still find them um, if, if you're looking hard enough. And, and you go to the, the right places. So I wanted to start out with, let's just go with the basics of, of what an amphibian is. I'm just going to hide the screen here. Um, so as you see, we have the life cycle of a frog. I'm sure many of you guys know the general life cycle. Um, they are cold-blooded. So for those of you who do not know, that just means they don't have actual cold blood. But what that means is that they just can't regulate their temperature. Um, so if they want to get warm, they need to go out basking in the sun. And if they're too hot, they need to find shade. The word amphibian actually can be broken down into amphi, which means dual, and bion or bio, which means life. So a dual life. So this fact that the frogs or, or salamanders, uh, newts, can go into this life cycle where they first start in the water and then they come out as an adult and uh, are out on land. Uh, frogs or salamanders, amphibians in general, are good ecological indicators because they will breathe through their skin. So if there's chemicals in the water or something just isn't the same in that environment, normally it will impact uh, amphibians because they breathe through their skin. So I just wanted to talk uh, quickly about the difference between a frog and a toad. We actually only have one species of toad in the Maritimes, which is the American toad, which I will uh, give you guys a little bit more information on. But the, there are some key differences uh, between the two. 
So for frogs, um, for their hind legs, they have these long, powerful legs. So if you walk up to a frog, normally, if you startle them, they're going to jump fairly far away. Whereas if you come across a toad, these guys have shorter legs for walking, and normally they'll just hop away from you. They can't really get that far. Their legs are really short. Um, toads also don't have webbed feet, but frogs have quite webbed feet. Whenever they lay their eggs, frogs will normally lay them in clusters in the water, which you would have seen back in the spring, and their young live in the water. For toads, they normally lay their eggs in a chain. Um, sometimes some species of toad will actually give birth to live young, but the one in the maritimes um, lays them in eggs. So if you were seeing uh, eggs laid in a chain, it's probably from an American toad. Uh, frog skins are normally moist and smooth, very shiny, whereas a toad, they're very dry and bumpy. It's also a myth uh, that toads are going to give you warts. Um, for habitat, frogs are normally in moist environments, so in like a wetland area, maybe close to water, uh, whereas a toad prefer dry environments. I normally find toads whenever I'm taking a hike through like a conifer stand, um, something that is in softwood area. Um, teeth. Frogs actually do have teeth, bombonier teeth, and what that is is just these um, little small things on the roof of their mouth, and they just have that so that they can hold their prey, whereas toads do not have any teeth at all. So that's just the general difference between frogs and toads, and now I'm going to just get into the types of amphibians that we have in New Brunswick and how to ID them. So we'll start with salamanders first. So the first is the blue spotted salamander, and with its name, it's pretty obvious how you ID these guys. So they have blue spots all across their, their body. They like to spend a lot of time underground, and if you're looking for these guys, normally they're going to be under rocks or uh, logs. And they kind of are normally in damper forests or wetlands. Um, I'm in Fredericton, so I'm kind of thinking of Fredericton examples, but at Hyla Park Nature Preserve, there's a bunch of blue spotted salamanders if you look under rocks and logs. If you're not looking for them under these um, features, then you're probably not going to see these guys. They grow up to about 5.5 uh, inches, and yeah, they are pretty secretive if you don't know, if you're not looking for them in the right places. Second here is a spotted salamander. So these guys have these yellow spots. They like to live in dens that other animals leave behind. A lot of people also find spotted salamanders in things like greenhouses or their sheds. So they kind of like human structures. These guys are one of the biggest of the salamanders that we have. So they go up to about eight inches. And um, yeah, so they have this yellow spotting on the back, this speckled on their stomach. Um, I wanted to note too that with some of these salamanders, like blue spotted and yellow spotted salamanders, this pattern that they have on their back um, is actually unique to every individual. So research on salamanders, um, if someone's doing a mark and recapture study, uh, they can take a photo of their back and they're able to identify that individual from another. So those patterns are always different per individual or sometimes even on their belly can have a unique pattern. These guys can also secrete a harmful toxin on their glands and on their tail to deter predators. Next is the redback salamander. So this is one is the most abundant vertebrate on the landscape. Um, these guys more so like mature woodlots uh, with fallen logs and coarse weighted debris. So again, you would need to be flipping over um, logs and, and rocks to, to find these guys. Um, I find these guys all over Odell. Um, they're smaller, so whenever you lift up that log, uh, you almost think for a second it could be a worm because because they're smaller. Um, but they have this red stripe that's down their back. Sometimes it can be a different coloration, and you can sometimes get confused with a two-line salamander. Um, but they normally have this reddish back to them. Next is the northern dusky salamander. This guy is actually quite rare in other provinces, and I think it's an S3 species uh, uh, here, but these guys are lungless, so what that means is that they actually just breathe through their skin. Their back legs are much larger than their front, and they have this gray to yellow brown in color. Uh, you can normally find these guys on the sides of smaller streams. So again, these guys can be found in Odell Park and those side streams. People 
will lift up rocks um, to find them. And these guys will grow up to about five and a half inches in length. Next is the four-toed salamander. So this guy is very rare. Um, it's still not certain if this guy is even in New Brunswick, but people should go look in and, and see if they could find it because that would be very interesting if we did have these guys in the province. Um, they are also lungless. They are about four inches long and they're the only land living salamander with four toes on their back feet. Um, just a fact, not only for the four-toed salamander, but for many other salamander species, if they feel threatened, uh, they will drop their tail or play dead. Um, and if you're handling salamanders and you grab them by the tail first, they will drop their tail. So if you're ever trying to handle salamanders, just be careful with them and, and try not to scare them because if they drop their tail, the amount of energy it's going to take them to, to regrow that is pretty high. So just watch for that if you're looking for salamanders. Next one is the two-line salamander. So this guy can sometimes be confused with the red back, um, but these guys have normally a yellowish olive, stri olive stripe down the back, and it's bordered by that, those very two thick black lines um, on its sides. This guy is also lungless, and normally they're a nocturnal. You can also find this guy close to streams like the northern dusky salamander. Then there is the red spotted newt. I still have not seen this guy, um, but they are very pretty. They have this bright orange, um, and they have these olive green with red spots. They can grow up to five inches, and normally they're going to be in an aquatic area, probably a wetland. Um, they have rough skin and they're more aquatic with a flatter tail. And that's kind of the difference between, sorry, between a salamander and newt. A newt is technically a salamander, um, but they have this rougher skin, they're more aquatic, and they have a flatter tail. Okay, now we're going to get into the frogs, which I think can be a little bit confusing. Um, so the mink frog, these guys grow up to about two to three inches. Um, they're very aquatic. They can produce a stinky, musty odor when disturbed or threatened. Uh, and so I, I don't think you're really going to hear much calling right now. Um, there might be still some that, that might be going or maybe the younger ones, but maybe thinking back to the spring, whenever you were hearing frogs, we'll, we'll try and see if we can get you guys to remember any of them. But a mink frog, it sounds like a hammer tapping on wood. And so I'm going to play this, hopefully. Let me know if it works. I hope that worked. No, it's not working. Hmm. You can't hear it now? So, oops. So to ID these guys, so the mink frog can be confused with a northern leopard frog. It also could be confused with uh, a green frog, which I'll point it out the differences when when I get to them. But when you look at these guys, uh, they have an olive to brown in color, and their spots are uh, kind of more blotchy. They're not as distinct and round. Um, and normally on the sides of their legs. They also have very wedged feet uh, and large eardrums. So it's, I think the most distinguishing factor here is the fact that their spots are more blotchy um, and they're olive to brown. That's the most key uh, feature here. Then for the next one, we have the pickerel frog. So these guys will grow between 1.5 to 3 inches. They like to hibernate at the bottom of streams and ponds. They can produce a toxin uh, through their skin that can be fatal to other animals. 
And their call kind of sounds like a snore or it could be like a mooing cow. Let me just play that one. I find that one kind of creepy. <laughs> it, uh, and if you're going to a wetland at 10 o'clock at night, whenever it's really dark and you hear a pickle frog, um, it's not a sound that I great. No, you're still not hearing it, eh? Hmm. Can anyone else hear it? Can I just get like a few people comment? I can't hear it. I cannot hear it, Shailen. Hmm. I don't know how to fix that. I wonder if Okay, I'm just going to try that and see if that works. Did you hear it that time? No. <laughs> but you have a good description of the sound on your slides. Hmm. Okay, just a sec. I might just... Hmm. Okay. Okay. I'm going to see if I can play some on my phone for you as we're, as we're going. So hopefully you heard that, at least, because that's on my phone. I could not hear it. It's not really? That. No. That's odd that you can hear me, but you can't hear my phone. Okay, well, look, uh, hopefully the descriptors are enough. Um, it's odd because this worked when I did it for Hampton, but I'm not sure why it's not working now. Something I'll have to look into. Okay. Um, look it up <laughs> later then. You can't, they shouldn't be calling now anyway, but... Um, you might still hear some of those calls. Sorry about that. I'm not sure why that's not working. Um, so to ID a pickle frog, um, these guys can be confused with a leopard frog and because of the spotting. And the biggest difference between the two is that with a the pickle frog, these, uh, the dots on their back, they're actually in a, in a neat line that's going down their back. Whereas a leopard frog, those spots are going to be um, random on, on their back. Um, they also can have this bright yellow or yellow orange on the inside of their thigh. So in this individual, you can kind of see that there's some yellow, yellow peeking out from their leg there. So that's kind of the biggest difference is that spotting. So then with a the northern leopard frog, so these guys can grow up to about four and a half inches and they're named after the spotting that they have on, on their skin. These guys will hop in a zigzag pattern to avoid predators. Uh, so if you're trying to catch one of these guys, what you'll find is whenever you walk up to them, um, they'll go in a direction that you weren't expecting and they'll just keep zigzagging and it's actually kind of hard to, to catch them once, once they spot you. Um, they have these irregular spots, like I was just saying, and whenever you're listening to these guys, they have snore-like grunts, which you won't be able to hear, but that's that's what they, they have as a descriptor. Yeah. 
Okay, the next is the American toad. So these guys are a little bit smaller, so two to three and a half inches. And as I was saying earlier, they are mainly terrestrial. So, and these guys are the only toad found in Eastern Canada. Uh, they can secrete a toxin that's, can, uh, that's a mild poison that can irritate the skin. And for sound on these guys, it's a monotone trail and they can last up to 30 seconds. I played that one for a second. It was super loud. So if you can't hear that, then I don't know if it's my mic, but um, these guys uh, have spots that two to three spots within those warts. Um, and I think one of the biggest things to identify these guys is this light line, this white line that's going down the middle of their back. None of the frogs will have that. But as you can see, this guy has warty like skin. They have these black rings that are going around some of these um, these warts warts that we call them um and so they're they're pretty distinguishable and if you're going to walk up to them as i was saying earlier they're not going to go very far it's like one of the only amphibians that whenever you come up it, they're not very fast so it's it's pretty easy to identify these guys when you when you see them the next is the green frog and the green frog is a tricky one to id i'll get that into that in the next slide um they can grow up to one to four inches they can get quite large and they are very territorial. So males can wrestle over lily pads. They have these powerful back legs, which have made them the fastest amphibian in North America. And these guys can hibernate under the water. And their call sounds like a banjo. It's like whenever someone takes a string and pulls it back and, and it comes back to the banjo, that's kind of what they, they sound like. <laughs> So these guys can be mistaken for a mink frog, a leopard frog, a bullfrog. Um, and, and the reasoning being is that the color on them changes by individual. They can be brown, they can be bronze, they can be green, and sometimes they can actually be blue. Um, that is a rare condition, kind of like um, albinoism, um, whereas there's a genetic uh, component going on and blue can actually come through. Uh, at Hyla Park, there's probably at least two to three observations of these blue green frogs uh, in the park actually. Um, but because of that, they can have random spots on them and, and it can make it confusing with, with other species. Uh, the biggest way to know the difference is that they have a small eardrum, so it's smaller than their eye, which is going to distinguish between a green frog and a bullfrog. Then they also have this ridge that is along their uh, along the side of them that goes halfway down their back. So those are the two biggest factors when IDing an individual. The next is the American bullfrog. So these guys live in water. They're the largest frog in North America and they can grow up to seven and a half inches. They are sit and wait predator and they will eat anything that will fit in its mouth, including birds. So sometimes these can be tricky in a wetland um, at, uh, ecosystem because they will eat, they literally will, will eat everything. Uh, and sometimes that can come, become problems for, for other species. These guys sound like a cow with a cold, or sometimes people can hear a uh, jug o rum in their call. So to distinguish this guy from the green frog, it's normally, normally you ID them through this eardrum. So this eardrum is huge, it's bigger than its eye. And as you can see, there's no ridge on its back, whereas the green frog had that had that large ridge or that ridge going halfway down. Next is the wood frog. So these guys can change the color of their skin depending on the temperature. So they can get a little bit darker, a little bit lighter. Uh, they grow up to about three inches. So these guys are a little bit smaller. They can freeze their bodies during the winter and they can unthaw in the spring. Um, these guys are normally in a uh, drier atmosphere. So whenever I find these guys, it's normally outside of the wetland, probably more in a uh, conifer stand like the American toad. And the way to identify these guys is they have ridges along their back and they have this black mask. So right 
uh, behind his eye, there's that very dark brown area, which will be black whenever he changes his color as well. So, um, but that mask is very unique to all the frogs. No other frog has that in, in the Maritimes. And for a call, these guys sound duck-like. They're one of the ones in the spring that are pretty much one of the first ones to call in April-ish. Next up is the spring peeper. So these ones are the smallest. Uh, they grow between one and a half to two inches long. They can be super hard to find and they blend in very well. They will hibernate under logs and loose bark. And these ones you will normally hear in May. They're super loud. Um, they're probably what makes you realize that that spring is coming whenever you hear these guys. Um, and even whenever you go to look for them at night, uh, whenever you hear them calling, they're super hard to find. They're super small and they're fast uh, and they'll get away from you really easily uh, whenever you come up to find them. They have a high pitch peep that go that just repeats over and over and over again. And so the spring peeper can be confused with a gray tree frog. Um, and it's because both of these guys have these toe pads on their feet uh, and they have a pattern on their back. But the difference between a spring peeper and a gray tree frog is that a spring peeper will always have this X on its back that you can see in this photo, whereas a gray tree frog is not going to have an X. It's going to be a very random type of pattern. So the best way to distinguish is the fact that these guys have an X on their back. Gray tree frogs are also bigger than a spring peeper, but I think if you're looking at the back pattern, that's the best way to distinguish between the two. You likely wouldn't see these guys now. And then Lastly is a great tree frog. This one is my favorite. Uh, that's why I left it for last. So these guys are uh, three to five centimeters in length. They have large suction cup like toe pads. So like I was just saying, very similar to the spring peeper. So it helps them climb trees. And they are able to uh, change their color. So the scientific name for the great tree frog is the Hyla versicolor. And versicolor means changing of colors. So they can be green like this guy. They can be gray. They can go to like a darker brown uh, and it all just depends on their background. They have a unique pattern. So like the salamanders, uh, their pattern is unique per individual. So as I was saying, as Mary, when she was introducing you, was saying that we do a mark and recapture with great tree frogs. Um, the way that we mark them is by taking photos of, of their back, and that's how we're able to identify one individual from the other. These guys are normally in wetlands, uh, and you're probably not going to see them unless you go out at nighttime. Um, normally, they're probably high up in the tree during the day, and then at night, the males and the females will come down to the ground uh, to mate on the ponds, and that's whenever they start calling and they're not going to start calling until it's dark. Sometimes they will during the day, but if you are going to go look for these guys in the spring, you need to be going later in the evening whenever it's starting to get dark and they start calling. And once they start calling, um, the males kind of don't care uh, that you're there. They just want to find a mate. So if you're looking for a great tree frog, that'd be the best time, which it, they normally start calling in June. That would be the best time to, to look. Um, and the young ones uh, become come out in August. So sometimes you can find these guys, they're bright green, they're smaller than a loony, and you can find those guys in, in August and they're quite abundant in, in Hyla Park. And so their call is a short lute trill, um, which sometimes can be confused with the spring peeper, but their breeding seasons are different. Spring peepers are in May and great tree frogs are in June. So that's all of the amphibians that I'm going with you today. I just wanted to quickly just say um, a note about handling amphibians, even though I think right now, if you went looking for um, frogs or salamanders, you probably would be able to find salamanders if you flipped over rocks and such. Uh, and for frogs, uh, there's probably green frogs, leopard frogs, bullfrogs, all of those would probably still be uh, hopping around and not into hibernation yet. So they're still around if you want to go looking. 
if you're handling amphibians, not like we're using bug spray right now. Uh, but if you went in the spring, just do not wear bug spray if you're going to handle frogs because they breathe through their skin. If you're wearing bug spray, um, they're going to they're going to um, take that into their bodies, which is which is harmful for them. Um, Whenever you're holding them, you want to have your fingers on the back of them, holding them gently in place. As I was mentioning before, do not grab a salamander by the tail. And also when you're looking for salamanders, uh, a lot of people sometimes will, they'll flip over logs, they'll flip over rocks, and, and they won't put their habitat back to where it was. Um, or whenever they're done looking, they just drop the log or drop the rock where it was. And so just be gentle with their habitat, put the logs back to where you found them or the rocks back to where you found them so that they can have that habitat uh, for later. And uh, that that is all. Is there any questions? Sorry that we couldn't listen to the sound. Oh, you were hearing some of them. Hmm. Okay. Well, we did, uh, yes, we did hear some of them towards the end. So that was great. And we'll be sure to look up the other ones. Um, I have a question though, when you were talking about handling uh, the animals, you also mentioned that some of them secrete toxins. So do we need to be wary of that? No, no, you wouldn't have to be, no, you wouldn't have to be actually wary whenever you're, you're handling. Most of them are for like predators. So you would be okay. And I do see there are some questions in the chat for you there. If you wanted yeah. to read those. Sure. So what is the range of the gray tree frogs in New Brunswick? So, um, I'm just going to give a little context. Back in the 90s, it was thought that gray tree frogs didn't come into New Brunswick. And then we found, um, naturalists found gray tree frogs at Hyle Park in Fredericton. And because of that, we ended up protecting uh, that nature preserve for the gray tree frogs. Since that time now, it seems that gray tree frogs have expanded their range. So they should be uh, southern New Brunswick up to probably about Woodstock. And it seems like they're mostly on the western side of the province right now. Um, whether or not that is the range, I think it's questionable. I think sometimes it's hard for people to find gray tree frogs and to submit that data. Um, so it, it's possible that that they could be elsewhere and we just haven't found them. I think a lot are incidental records and, and it's possible that they could be more east, but they definitely should be in, in southern New Brunswick as well. Um, repeat the sound of the spring peeper. Yes, let's do that. Just a second. Oops. Okay. So I hope you were actually able to hear the sound that time. I might just play, play the great tree frog one in case I was going through them fast because I assumed you couldn't hear them. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure why it's being so tricky. Okay. So I did I did hear the gray tree frog, but not the peeper. I put hmm. Very interesting. I put on my mic that you could hear everything. <laughs> so like clicking on a keyboard or hearing like a car outside, but I'm not sure why it won't fully play. Um, and for, I see another one about the toxins of salamanders. It normally can be toxic to any, um, anything that eats it actually. So, but, whether or not that's different per salamander, I'm not really certain, but it can be very toxic and, and, and kill some, well, maybe not kill, but it can be dangerous for, for another animal to, to eat them. So, but you shouldn't have any concerns with actually handling them. 
that looks like um, all of the questions that we've got. I'm sure there uh, are a lot more. And so if people have more questions, can they get in touch with you, Shailene? Definitely. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. Is, is that at, uh, at the province? Yeah, I can do the province or the UMB one, either either one works. Okay. Um, and I'm just gonna say too, if I know we're coming on the end of the season, but any observations that, that you guys have of amphibians or reptiles, uh, also love like the turtles and, and snakes, um, posting to iNaturalist is a good way to do that. And us talking about ranges and like the four-toed salamander, um, any of that data that you find, we'll go to ACCDC and, and that does help with assessing species and, and knowing where, where they're at. So definitely always recommend submitting to iNaturalist or to ACCDC if, if you find these species. And when you were talking about the four-toed salamander um, with the four toes on its back, the other salamanders have five toes, do they? Yeah. On their back? yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah, there's also a three-toed salamander, not here, but that, that is also a salamander in Canada. Oh, great. Yeah. Okay, well, that was wonderful, Shaylin. Thank you very much. And um, I think um, you didn't talk uh, a whole lot about the Gray Tree Frog Project, but just mentioning that um, that that uh, that Hyla Park is protected, it, it just shows the importance of that. And, and perhaps it did have um, the effect of helping to expand the territory. So uh, just by protecting that area. So uh, thank you. It was really interesting. And for the sounds that we didn't hear, thank you for putting a verbal description on your slides. Um, and, and I jotted those down. And so I'm going to listen to those as well. And uh, yeah, so continue on with that great work. So right now in your work, are you dealing with amphibians and reptiles with your species at risk work? Uh, I do a lot with the turtles right now since the, those are our species at risk at the moment. So I don't deal as much with amphibians, but I'm definitely working a lot with wood turtle and, and thinking about ways that we should be protecting them and, and, and going forward. So that's always fun. Turtle stuff is always great. Oh, well, I want to thank you for taking time to talk to the club this morning. We really appreciate it. And I'd like to thank everyone uh, for tuning in this morning and uh, join us again on November 19th for our next section, uh, next session on the Fundy Biosphere. So thanks, Shailene, and have a great uh, weekend, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.